Countless haters. You walk around like your shit don't stink. You unsuccessful because your brain don't think ideas on your mind, but your heart won't sink. Full size and IG, but you slip in the ring. You mix, I do it better than you. Prophecy on what I do. Sports show that talks about sports and other topics relatable to sports fans. Joining me this week is our constant host, uh, co-host, finally, uh, Harris Berger. <laughs> really, really big news for the New York Mets. Uh, they have new ownership now. Seems to be all but official. What? I think there's still a little bit of uh, red tape. Uh, that's still being finalized, but it looks like we're going to have a go, and um, Steve Cohen is going to be the owner for the New York Mets. Absolutely. What, what are your thoughts on that? Look out, because this guy, this guy is ready to walk into the door and spend money. Yeah. He already said he's ready to operate in the red for seven to ten years in order to build this team. This is a guy who's been a Mets fan for years and years and years, finally gets the chance to kick the Wilpons out of town. Mm -hmm. Bring himself in the door, spend all the money. I'd make look out for making him a big, make, for him to make a big splash in free agency this summer or this winter. Yeah, I think that it's it's an exciting time for Mets fans. And, and you think about how many sports fan bases have owners that they don't like, and they're always like, oh, they need to sell the team, but it's never it's never gonna happen. I mean, a lot of uh, New York Knicks and New York Rangers fans <laughs> wish that James Dolan wasn't, you know wasn't the owner anymore, but it's not realistic that he's ever going to go anywhere. Um, so this is this actually happened. Like this was a, a somewhat unrealistic turn of events that ended up unfolding, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I think in terms of New York sports, you look at all the ownership around. I, I think aside from George Steinbrenner, the Steinbrenner family now, this was one of the ones that nobody thought that the Wilpons would let go. And I think this is one of those things where Mets fans – were pleading and begging on their hands and knees to God every Sunday yeah. to get new owners in there who are willing to spend money and build a winner because they're tired of looking over at that next borough and seeing winners, yeah. right? And this is where Mets fans can now celebrate because they, they're going to have a good team now. Well, at least that on paper, you think that this guy, if he lives up to what he says he's going to do, they're going to build a winner out there in Queens and, and it's going to be – a fun time for Mets fans and around the league. I think this guy's going to shake up the league quite a bit, and it's going to be fun to watch. Yeah, I think when 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 it comes down, you look at the the Mets fan base, and they're a, a long suffering fan base. They yeah. uh, their last uh, World Championship was 1986, and you know just a, a lot of years of just being a doormat. Like they just weren't even competitive at all, not really making the playoffs. And then they they made a little bit of noise in 2000 and 2015, but these are like few and far between like these are long stretches and then you have a, a bunch of Mets fans uh, I, I know a lot of Mets fans who are season ticket holders and just long suffering just uh, we had a uh, we had pin man and cowbell man here uh, a couple months ago uh, yeah. and you know like they they had more bad stories than good stories when it came to the Mets you know as, as as far as the actual team itself you know obviously being a fan is great you know the people you meet through any sports any any sports team you you have a uh, great fans that you yeah, you meet with and you know you develop like a second family and those mm -hmm. things like that those are those are non-negotiable those are always going to happen which mm -hmm. is fantastic and that's a, for the Mets fans is like a lot of the reasons why to go to the games like they, you don't even go for the games like you just go to party like uh we had a previous host here uh, uh Dennis Herrera who talked about that like he just he just wanted to go party he didn't yeah. he, he didn't even care about the games which you know that was realistic but now now we're, we're looking at a fighting chance, which which is which is great for them. Yeah, I think the hype train's definitely rolling. It's already started, right? And as soon as he's taking over control, that's past the league boat. It's past everything that it needs to pass. I think the only red tape is just a couple signatures across some T's and dots some I's, and we'll see what happens. But I think the Mets over the last few years have, I mean, since 1986, have been this lovable losers type of mentality in, in over in Queens, and it's just so happened where. The Wilpons never did anything to rectify that since then. And this is now a new – it feels like a new breath of fresh air over there. Uh, they have a great facility at City Field. That's why it is a party. That baseball stadium is an awesome place. It's a great, great time. And 
I think if they continue to build around some of the pieces that they currently have with Pete Alonzo and O'Neal and a couple of those guys, or McNeil, excuse me, that if they continue to, to build around some of those guys and add some pieces with DeGrom there, obviously, Syndergaard can get healthy, they'll be able to build a winner. They've built some good teams that just haven't been able to quite get over the hump with some missing pieces. And I think that if, as long as Steve Cohen wants to go out and spend the money, he'll go out and spend it. And this team will be good for a couple years to come. Yeah, when when you look at the building of the team, it's not only the spending the money; it's getting the right people, mm -hmm. and then retaining uh, the right people. So when you look, well, when you look at the, at the Mets roster, a lot of times they lose free agents that you know can play in New York, and then they end up getting other people like a Jason Bay, and you know other. Well, there's a ton of horror stories out there yeah. where, you know, like they come to New York and they, they, they can't handle New York. They can't, you know, they're just yeah. not performing well in New York. So, you yeah, know, exactly. th th there's a lot of different factors. It's not always the highest payroll, as uh, the New York Yankees can attest to, yeah. spending, what, what, like $3 billion <laughs> in the, uh, the past two decades yeah. and only getting one championship, you know. So, um, and then, you know, like the – the Mets, they, they try to go the and the analytic route uh, when Sandy uh, Sandy Anderson took mm -hmm. over, and you know like they try to put all these great baseball minds to kind of replicate what the the Tampa Bay Rays were able to do this year. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out. You know they they they've, they've always seemed to have really really good starting pitching, and the bullpen's always been awful, and just hitters that aren't able to hit consistently. Yeah, I agree. I, th I think that. You look at a lot of the moves that the Mets have made and free agents and things that they've brought in in the past, and it's they're they're overpaying for names, right? But yeah. those names are probably three to four years past their prime. You look at guys like Clint Frazier. You look at guys like Curtis Granderson. You look at guys. Um, I'm forgetting his name. He used to play for the Yankees, also. But the, these are guys that have been successful other places and kind of hit the decline of their career. And that's when the Wilpons are willing to spend the money to bring those guys in. And sure, they bring a nice veteran presence to the clubhouse, but it doesn't bring the on-field production that, you, that Mets fans were probably looking for when they heard those big names were signed, right? And you look at a guy like Jacob deGrom, who's won multiple Cy Young Awards in his career, and it's another – you're looking at another Kershaw situation where – a guy who's such a dominant pitcher and does just controls games and steals games when he can, that just isn't supported, right? And when he gets into the nitty gritty of it, he can win you games, but he needs help. He's right. not going, and he's not a guy that can pitch every. He's not a, a pitcher can't pitch every single night. And you have guys like Syndergaard who have been very good. The bullpen's been a disaster for the Mets, so that's going to be something that they're going to have to address in this off season. Um, they probably, I mean, Pete Alonso obviously is where this team is going to be built around with Pete Alonso and DeGrom, right? And DeGrom's another guy who might be on the back end of his career um, with some injury issues, and he's getting a little bit older. But with Pete Alonso, Jeff McNeil, some of those guys, Michael Conforto, they have some good pieces to build around, and they just need a couple more of those puzzle pieces to put together to build a winner here. And it, it's not like that New York is not a free agent uh, location. It's a great spot for some of these guys and a place where they might want to be. And sure, it's not the Bronx and it's not the quote unquote, well, it's not the house that we built anymore. They tore that one down. But <laughs> though it, it's, you're still in New York, the New York media, it's a big market. Um, and I think with the headlines surrounding new ownership, it's going to be a bigger market than people think. Yeah, that was the, that was the, the, the frustrating part from S fan because the the Mets were operating as if they were a small market team when they weren't. I mean, they're basically right, like in relativity right across the street from where the Yankees are, you know. And the Yankees have all this revenue and all this like great like storied history, fan base, and all these things. I mean, they, they would cross the street, you know, and and you know like whole U.S. terms. So it's not like they they really should be operating under uh, uh, a small market team. But that that was that was basically how they were parading around. Now. You know, like they can they can spend more, but hopefully they just spend more on the right people. You know, because even um, you know, there's a lot of different things that that turn into like mis mismanagement. Like you missed the window on Steve Matz, where you could have moved him, and then he ends up like 
now being relegated to bullpen like garbage now basically yeah. you know uh while he works while he works out you know his kinks and he's he's still young but yeah. you know like you're missing the window on these kind of moves too you know like th there's a lot of different things that uh that are going to have to transpire here but as far as when when you look at removing the the fan biases you like you look at what it would do for New York and if you have two competitive teams in New York where the Yankees that you know that they're pushing for titles they they're not they're not winning the titles but they you know they're in contention they're sure. they're up there uh they have a bit of a they have a bright future with uh having young superstars and uh when they cashed in on on the deadlines and then they they brought in a lot of young talent to replenish the the farm system so like they're ready to go so the Mets now are trying to catch up and when you have that battle for New York that also makes it interesting because you have two really good teams going, so like the two fanatical fan bases on each side, and then you have the the bandwagon side, the, mm -hmm. the bandwagon people who they kind of just sway to whoever's good, you know. Like the yeah. like I, I didn't I didn't think personally that that was a realistic thing, but then 2015 taught me that it it really is, you know. Like George Steinbrenner would always say that he didn't want um he didn't want the Mets being good because they would take fans away from the Yankees. And it was it was laughable for the longest time, but it really it really did happen. Like 2015, there were so many people, you know, wearing Mets fat, Mets hats, and are they rooting you know, for the Mets or around. they just want the party at the parade? That's it. it, it you know, what it is. whatever the case is, it 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 takes the revenue away from the sure, Yankees, absolutely. which is which is the bottom line. And that was that was his whole big picture point, which he he was really revolutionary, and that yeah. it really is true. You know, like there there is a a, a bandwagon middle ground of of New Yorkers. Yeah. And you know, like other surrounding areas like New Jersey and Connecticut and things like that, and you know, it's it's really realistic. So you have that battle going on as well, which will also push the Yankees further mm -hmm. and make the Subway Series better and those different things like that. You know, it's very exciting to have two two really really good teams from New York since. Every sport in New York has two teams on it. Yeah. So uh, well, let's not let's not get ahead of ourselves. The Mets have work to do. Right. Yeah, true. The Yankees have made the playoffs the last two years now, three years now, and the pieces for the Yankees are there. Right. The Yankees can build a winner. They've been competing. The Mets have pieces. They need more. And Steve Cohen is the first step in that direction. You brought up the Subway Series. This is actually the 20th anniversary of the Subway Series, the World Series, when we had the Yankees and the Mets um, go at it for the title. And uh, we look back to, we actually just did, I just was part of uh, an event for Sacred Heart University where they actually brought Joe Torre and, and Bobby Valentine on to uh, recoup, or to, um, to, to re relive that, series and to go over some of the highs and lows from that series and some of the, and you look at and we they showed a lot of clips of and I was young then so I didn't and I didn't live in New York so I didn't fully grasp um, the magnitude of that that this is something that's realistic I think for a lot of Mets fans now is they think that they can get back to the World Series and be competitive if Steve Cohen does what Steve Cohen says he wants to do right um, if if whoever else, the GM, whoever runs the show there and helps him out, uh, if they can move those pieces around to build a winner, we could very well see that again in the coming years. It's just a question of where this is going. This is a step in the right direction for this program, for this organization, and we'll see kind of where it goes. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be an exciting time for New York baseball all the way around, uh, whether you're a Yankee fan or you're a Mets fan, just because, you know, it just it brings more gravitivity – it brings more attention to the city itself and to baseball and, you know, having two powerhouses. It also helps the, the revenue and the economy all around. So it's, it's, it's really good uh, for everybody in New York, whether you're a Mets fan or a Yankee fan. Um, Yankee fans wouldn't agree, but it's really come, <laughs> that's what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going we're gonna to switch gears now, and we're going to talk about the NFL. Um, so one of the surprises, I guess, of the the season you're gonna do this to me this yeah season. yeah so we have a uh we, we have a boston born and bred uh compadre over here with uh with harris so um we're gonna talk about the new england patriots uh right now we're in we're in a uh a season that we haven't seen for maybe two decades you know, the the since 2002 we're since starting 2002. Since we're starting record since 2002 there you go so uh the new york uh new england patriots are two and five 
right now. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? It's surprising, you know. Um, I think in the off season when Tom Brady left, uh, Patriots fans were, were obviously the, everyone kind of saw the writing on the wall that this divorce between Brady and Belichick was going to happen. Um, but they didn't expect it to quite go this way, and I think that midway through the off season when Cam Newton signed his contract it kind of reinvigorated the Patriots fan base and they went oh we replaced one MVP with another we're fine let's yeah. compete and the record is surprising but with I believe it's like five starters on the defensive side of the ball opted out because of COVID they lost another four to free agency um this is a team that lacks leadership, I think, right now. And it, it's not, to be honest with you, it's not as surprising, I think, as people think. I think because of the dynasty that the Patriots have built in the last 20 years, people see a 2-5 and five record and they go, oh, this is not what we're used to, right? You look at guys who, even guys who are just graduating high school or in college, right? All they've known for the Patriots is winning. Um, it's the older generation that knows the older days, right? Before Tom Brady, where, yeah, they made, yeah, with the yeah. Bledsoe days, right? And they made some runs, and but it wasn't enough. Uh, that's when the Bills were good, and you see the Bills are a good team now. And but I think the Patriots have been in a lot of close games. You take out the San Francisco game where they got absolutely dominated, and you look at the Buffalo game last weekend. If 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 Cam Newton doesn't fumble. That game's either tied, the Patriots could go on to score a touchdown and win that game. And we're talking about a whole different topic this week where the Patriots are back, they're in first place, let's keep it rolling, right? Yeah. And, you know, let's see kind of where, where this thing goes. I, I'm shocked a bit, but at the same time, I think that with all of the missing pieces and all the cap issues especially we haven't touched on yet, which we'll probably get into, uh, there's no real weapons for Cam around him, right? Uh, Julian Edelman just went down with the knee scope. Uh, you're looking at Nikhil Harry's out with a concussion. They lost Gronk, obviously. You got Damian Bird. You got some of these guys who we don't really know a lot about them, right? Sony Michelle's been hurt. Rex Burkhead hasn't done as much as he has since week two. This is a team that came out and dominated the Dolphins, who have proved to be a good team. The Dolphins came out and they beat them week one. They won again, and they, they put on a great performance against Oakland and won that game. So the Patriots have issues to fill, but I think that obviously with the best coach ever yeah. at the helm, he'll make, he'll make adjustments as he sees fit. So I, I have to, uh, w w When it comes to the Tom Brady, Bill Belichick situation for a non-Patriots fan, I'd have to say that that totally blew me away. There's a lot of people who don't know a lot of the specifics of the situation, mm -hmm. and they think that Tom Brady just got um, money hungry and he just wanted to, you know, like jump for the money and things like mm -hmm. that, which he's always been. What well, one thing that you, can, you can't ever knock on Tom Brady is he's always taken under market value mm -hmm. so that he can help the salary cap. He's always been the team guy like that, which is, which is very commendable mm -hmm. uh, to any athlete of his magnitude. But... I don't really, you know, it really just blew me away that, or anybody else on the outside, that Tom Brady didn't just stay with the Patriots. You know, like it was, a, a, it was, it only came out afterwards for a lot of people that found out that it was actually the Patriots who were like, nah, nah, we don't want you. You know, it was just, it was weird. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you look kind of, you kind of saw the writing on the wall last season. If you kind of watched and you were in tune with it, especially if you were a Patriots fan, a lot of people, in New England have blinders on, right? All they wanted to see was another win, right? Yeah. But if you kind of looked at it, he didn't have a lot of weapons last year. Nobody really went out. They brought in Mohamed Sanu at the deadline last year, but how big of a weapon did he turn out to be? Not much, yeah. right? The defense was fantastic, and they ran into a great team in Tennessee, and we see how good they are now, right? Um, but you, you keep rolling through the, the, the checklist, right? And you see over the last few years, what the Patriots have done around, what the Patriots did for Tom Brady, right? And you don't see a ton. And they built up the defensive side of the ball. Bill Belichick is a defensive-minded coach. Josh McDaniels runs the offense, everybody knows. Um, and you could see now with the issues. And Bill Belichick came out and said this past week, uh, after the loss to the Bills, 
he said, look, we paid Cam Newton a million dollars. He said, we obviously have cap issues, but we went, we used that money to go. We went to three Super Bowls. We won two of them. We played in another AFC championship game. So you can't knock what they did, but I think that Tom needed more weapons. But and you see it now. But when you look at the history of what Tom Brady's had to deal with, he's, he, he really has had major production with not many stars. I mean, he had Randy yeah. Moss for, what was it, a season, two yeah. seasons? And, you know, that was basically it. You you have guys, you, the, there was a Dion Branch, there was a, a what, Troy Brown, there was a, yeah. an, another guy who was a Wes Walker, MVP. Danny Amendola. Yeah, so, so you had these guys that were sure. that were marginal before they got to the Patriots. Then they come to the Patriots and they're really, really good. And then they score these big contracts, and then they're garbage again. Well, you know, I think how, this, how many times have we seen that? One hundred percent. It shows that it shows the what Tom Brady has meant more than what has been around him. So yeah. basically, you know, you would think that if if Tom Brady was there this year, that he he would have more of an impact because it was like he he could. He could have like the the, the hot dog guy from the three hundreds and the mascot, you know, yeah. on flanking on each side, and they would still be able to like, get three hundred yards. And, it was just amazing. And you know, this this is exactly, and you see the success he's having in Tampa, right? And with yeah, he has Chris Godwin and Mike Evans. He's loaded up though. But you don't hear much about. First of all, Chris Godwin's missed time with a uh, head injury. Mike Evans miss, has missed time with an ankle injury. Gronk is coming off a, a year break. Yeah. He's, He's throwing passes changes. to a guy named Scotty Miller who has just become the new Julian Edelman. He just steps yeah. in and takes the rollover, right? And this, I think this takes out the argument that Tom Brady's a system quarterback. I yeah, think a lot uh, of people over the last few years with the success the Patriots have had have said, oh, he's defensive reliant. He's a system quarterback. He's not going to be successful without Josh McDaniel. And you see under Bruce Arians' offense, which is completely different than what Josh <laughs> McDaniels runs, it's night and day, the different kinds of offenses. You see the success he has. And the, the Bucks are Super Bowl contenders right now, and there's not a question about it. The Patriots are, are kind of in this no-man's land situation where they're not the Jets, right? They're not Nobody's the Giants, the right, right? They're not yeah. in bad. They're not in bad shape. They're just kind of in this no man's land situation where I think if you have those guys back, like Dante Hightower and Marcus Cannon and some of these guys that opted out, right, and they lost Kyle Van Noy, which is a key piece to that. Um, Eric Flowers, key pieces to that defense that are not there, right, and. Stephon Gilmore might the def last year's defensive player of the year. He's not having the same kind of season. Yeah, some suffering. of those pieces, yeah, some of those yeah. pieces that the team relied on last year to be successful, are, either aren't there or underperforming. And I think everybody as a whole is kind of underperforming. I think when Cam went down with COVID, I think it kind of took a shock out of that system because in that game against Kansas City. They were in it to the yeah, very yeah, end of that seemed, game. I actually saw that one. It was a very end. It was. It seemed like they were ready to get it. They were yeah. what three yards away from tying the game. Exactly. So, and you look at the the game against Seattle. We we talk about the like five Patriots have five losses before November. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Nobody yeah. ever thought that would Usually happen. They don't go through a whole season without. Exactly. So, there's a lot of season left. I think, especially the Bills, kind of are on this inconsistent we will wobble path where we don't really know kind of what they are yet is yeah. Josh Allen. Josh Allen's overperforming, but the defense yep. isn't helping him. And the defense is usually what carries that organization. They're supposed to have number one defense They're They're ranked 11 now. Yeah. So uh, the Patriots, you look at the close games with Kansas city. It was, they got stopped on the one yard line. They would have won that game in Seattle. Uh, they just lost a close game to the bills. That's three of the top teams in the league, right? So they're right in it to the very end with three of the top teams in the league. Aside from San Francisco, who just came in and bulldozed them inside Foxborough, which you never see happen. Um, I think that's another thing, too. The lack of crowd is really affecting Foxborough's oh, rowdy place. Ev everywhere, all over yep. the league. All over yeah, the and league. it's not an excuse for anybody, but the Patriots especially, it's um, you could tell it's affecting those guys. But a lot of season left, I think Belichick can figure out how to break the ship. And with this expanded playoff format, they might be able to find themselves sneaking in. I'd say that I – 
I've watched a lot of the Patriots just because you know I'm a New York Jets fan, as a lot of people know. So mm-hmm. I, I've seen I've seen Tom Brady twice a year, mostly mm-hmm. cursing him like ah, you know what I mean? Damn you, Tom Brady! So like that that's basically the the, the way it's gone down. But uh, you, you know, you, you, I, I, over the years, you know, I, I've appreciated aside from the whole like cheating thing and all that stuff like that. Like I, I've oh, I've, I've, bring that I've I've appreciated a lot of what of what he's been able to do uh, over the course of his career and not having a lot to work with, but still getting a lot done, which, mm-hmm. which, and also the, uh, the salary cap thing where he takes less than what he should, you know, he's, he's, he could have been t- making 20, 20 million dollars a year, like long ago, but he, you know, he's always, he's always cut back. He's always like been a team first guy, which is great. Um, but at, at this situation, I, I used to really, really hate the Patriots. I also lived in Boston for four years. So I like, I really, it was in my face all the time. It was just awful, you know. And um, they were just super awesome. They, they won a championship in one of the, the years I was over there. And um, I find myself now kind of not rooting for them, but I don't hate them as much, you know. Like they're the underdogs now. Like they're they're not expected to be super dominant. They, I know, think Cam you, Newton is. You're the only one that thinks that. Yeah, way. I think Cam the Newton. people still see that Patriots logo, and they still. It's not like we're five years removed from a dynasty 10 years removed from it this team co- is coming off a super bowl win two years ago they went to the playoffs last year they've won the division every year for the last mm, 16 years i believe um uh, in a row and it's just yeah. it's not a uh, you're in the minority if you think that the patriots are an underdog right and uh the patriots are still the patriots belichick as long as he's still in the building people are still not going to like that team, right? And I think long after he's gone, people are still not going to like that team. Um, but, yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting dynamic. It's a different storyline for this season, yeah. and it's opened the door for the Bills to be good. Um, the Dolphins are right in the mix, too. Which now I hate the Bills. Bills have supplanted <laughs> the Patriots as my most hated AFC East rival. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely interesting to see, um, and we'll see kind of where this – this team goes and the bucks are six and two so they're absolutely rolling right now they are uh like you said a a, 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 a uh, super bowl championship contender for sure they're right now they're my pick for the super bowl well they, they have that that super style defense to go along with all the names that they added offensively exactly you know so it's just that's exactly the point and now it's meshing it seemed like it was a little rocky at first and then yep. now it seems to be coasting i think they they are 100 i think and fine you know what let's do it on this show right now the the bucks are my nfc pick for the super bowl hmm. i'll say that right now they will go to the super bowl in tampa by the way on their, be on their home field, and they will go, at least go. We'll see. I'll give them another week before I decide if they're going to be the winners yet, but we'll see how that goes. All right. So uh, but before we get into that, uh, you mentioned the point about the uh, the no fans. There was uh, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, there was the game that it was the Packers versus the Saints, mm-hmm. and Aaron Rodgers have ne- has never won in New Orleans, and then he ended up picking the picking up the victory, and one of the things he attributed it to was the hard count. Like, And that's that's one thing that – we we don't take into consideration when it comes to the 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 home crowd and the the road crowds like when you play on the road especially in some place like the Superdome mm-hmm. the the hard count for the offense of the road team doesn't work cuz you have the, the 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 loud sounds and everybody's like you know disrupting it um th- that's one fact that I didn't actually think about but it's really it's, it's it's helped out a lot of teams that have not had to like that have the hard counts working on the road and that's yeah. that just makes it it doesn't really matter wh- where the game is in the, in the NFL yeah. if it's going to be that way so very interesting point there. yeah it's brought in a whole new dynamic to the game for sure and it's it's taken obviously home field advantage has been cu- has been cut completely out and it's opened the door for guys like Aaron Rodgers those guys that have those good hard counts that rely on those hard counts to be successful uh, really, and draw those offsides calls, it, and they are being successful, and we can see that. And and, and thinking in that light, they might as well have just had, uh, like, just 16 locations and just have people shuttling in and out because, mm-hmm. you know, w- what's the point of going, you know, into MetLife in an empty stadium? You know, what's the, w- traveling to th- going there and then traveling to Buffalo the next mm-hmm. week, which is also an empty stadium. I mean, it doesn't matter. You can just have them in – have them in the same places. Like yeah. it's still, you know, 100 yards, 120 yards, all all the way. Because well, the matter. NFL likes money, <laughs> and the NFL where they can have fans have had them. Yeah, 
And if we picked a bubble and we bubbled the, the league, which you can't do. There's too many players, too many staff. You just yeah. can't do it. It's unrealistic for the NFL to do. Uh, but as long as the NFL can sell tickets, they're going to sell tickets, right? It doesn't matter. If it, I mean, you saw it with the MLB. The MLB still, they, they, yeah, they bubbled for the playoffs, but there were fans in that stadium. So if they can sell tickets, they're going to sell tickets, and that's just yeah. a fact. Which, uh, which is going to bring us to a, a, a point a little later in the show if we have time. Uh, but what, first, uh, we're going to stay on the NFL, and we have, uh, we're going to start giving out some half-season awards. So uh, Offensive Player of the Year, who you got? Man, Offensive Player of the Year, halfway through the season, it, it's got to be either Derrick Henry or Russell Wilson to me, and I'm going to go with Russell Wilson. And, I mean, you look at the, what he's done the first eight weeks of the season – and the, what the dynamic he's brought to Seattle. And it's just continued, right? So he's the clear-cut MVP favorite right now. There's nobody that's even coming close at this point. And no Pat Mahomes? Uh, oh, Patrick Mahomes, sorry. I've, I've actually, yeah, you uh, know. I found out the whole, uh, there's, there's, you know, you can't mom really. mom likes to call him. Yeah, you can't call, call Patrick. Pat, the Mitchell, yeah, the Mitchell Patrick Mitch Trubisky Henry. argument, right? I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> with, uh, with Patrick Mahomes' mom. She, uh, not that she knows who I am, but I don't want her to find out who I am under those circumstances. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, what Patrick Mahomes has done and continues to do is fantastic. He's won an MVP. Russell Wilson's playing on the same level he is and has never even received a vote. For MVP, and which is crazy to me because this isn't this isn't new. It's, they're just more successful. So, to me, Russell Wilson right now with the weapons he has and Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, you and then you add the running game when they're healthy. Chris Carson, uh, Carlos Hyde. That's a good team offensively. They have problems on the defensive side of the ball, but this is an individual award, right? So, Russell Wilson's my offensive player of the year right now and my MVP favorite halfway through the season. So uh, offensively, I got to go with uh, Derrick Henry uh, because he's – right now he's like 125 uh, yards over the, the second place. He's like clearly winning the the, the rushing title in, in, in an era where you really don't have like one dominant guy on each team. Like this is not the 90s where you had like – your Emmett Smiths and your Thurman uh, Thurman uh, Thomas and people like that, where that were just you know you had one guy he just ran the ball 30, 35 times a game like th he he's basically like old school yeah. in, in that in that respect uh, he's he's not really sharing um, anything he's just basically he's always going out there he's a thir on third down he's just and he's just a machine he's like he's like the Shack of running backs you know like the Shaquille O'Neal running backs he's just uh, completely dominant and he makes Ryan Tannehill worth a damn. Like, the, th think about all those years that we, he was in Miami. Um, I'm not a huge. Who was his coach? I'm not. A, Who was his coach in he, Miami? And all right, so Adam Gase. Yeah, okay. But so not, got out not, from under not, Adam not Gase. his whole career though. He was there a couple of years, but not his whole career. Yeah, but the Dolph When have the Dolphins had a good quarterback since Dan Marino? Right. So the Dolphins don't have. The Dolphins aren't quarterback gurus, right? But they the, never have. You, you know, when you look at a, a Ryan Tannehill, he's he's basically. He's not throwing for 400 yards a game. He's, he, he has. He's, he's yes, a he great, has. Well, I mean, all, consistently every game. He, I think the last four games he's thrown for at least 300. I'd say, I'd say mostly he's like a game manager. But then you, when you look at when you go back to the Derrick Henry factor, when you have that powerful run game, that opens up the passing. That, that, that's been, you know, yeah, since, since, the, since the beginning of time. So when, when you think about it, you have such a dominant runner mm -hmm. that you make your quarterback better. And that's something that, uh, like, is not mentioned widely enough. You know, like Ryan Tannehill, you know, he gets a lot of credit. He doesn't make, you know, a lot of mistakes. I think he's more of a great game manager than an actual, like, takeover, kind of like a Drew Brees or, you know, like a Tom Brady, things like that. Um, and Derrick Henry, Derrick Henry just, he, he just does it all for that team. Uh, just one guy who, if you take that guy out, just completely messes up the whole team. And, you know, like when you mentioned like a Russell Wilson, like, yes, the quarterback position is very important, but when you have other weapons around, yeah. it's possible to have somebody else fill in and, you know, not, you know, do do a suitable job. But there's no replacing Derrick Henry, you know, and that that's one thing where it comes to – when it comes to the MVP, in my opinion, that's the one thing that always um, supersedes everything else. Yeah. And defensive player of the year, who you got? I, this is, 
this is an easy pick. It's a it's not exactly a big thinker here, and that's Aaron Donald. This is a guy who just he wrecks games. He's we talk yeah. about Derrick Henry and how he takes over. This is a guy who does it on the defensive side of the ball. Um, he either takes away two linemen to block him, and then someone else gets around the edge in that team. Uh, that's my NFC pick. I have, I have a pick for the AFC, but the my NFC pick easily would be Aaron Donald, and uh, Aaron Donald just changes the dynamic of the the front defensive front for teams and and how and the abil- his ability to just break off tackle break off blocks and get into the backfield and and track down quarterbacks is crazy. On the other side, it's T.J. Watt. T.J. Watt on that on that Pittsburgh defense has just changed. He, he he is his brother, but he's faster. And he moves faster. He gets off of blocks quicker. And J.J.'s had issues with injuries. T.J., knock on wood, hasn't had those issues yet, and it's fun to watch. But the two of those, both of those guys on the defensive side of the ball and the defensive line are the reason why pass rushers are the highest paid players outside of the quarterback position, for sure. All right, so when it comes to the AFC, I'm going to go with uh, Miles Garrett, who's not – one of the more popular players in the league because of all his no, we bu- took a guy's head off last year with a helmet. yeah <laughs> Mason Randolph that was crazy so uh you know he's at nine sacks he has four four uh uh he's tied for the league league lead in nine sacks uh he has four forced fumbles and uh two fumble recoveries uh he's you know he was number one pick a couple years ago and he's just like absolutely dominating games for the Browns who are probably the, the biggest uh, surprise team. We'll get to that in a little bit. But, um, you know, he's he's one of the, the biggest reasons why they are in, you know, the, they are where they are. There's like 5-2, five, 6-2. Five two, two. Um, and then in the defense, uh, for the defensive player of the year, I'm actually going to go with the Bucks, uh, uh cornerback Carlton Davis. Um, he is – he has he's tied uh, with the league leader with four interceptions, uh, leading the – uh, with uh, 13 passes defended, 33 solo tackles, which if you look at uh, 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 the, the um, who you mentioned, uh, Donald, and then you look at Garrett, they're all swimming around 30, 30 tackles too. So, you know, they're it's kind of a wash there. And then, um, you know, he's, he's a, a part of the number one ranked defense shutting it uh, as a shutdown corner. I, uh, he would get my vote. Yeah, I, that's a great pick. I think right now you could – pretty much pick out anybody on the defensive side of the ball in, in Tampa Bay yeah. and and find somebody who's contributing. Um, Todd Bowles is running a fantastic defense in, in Tampa Bay. Former Jets yeah, head I mean, coach. You would think that the, – and this guy, he might not have been a great head coach, but the guy can run a defense. Well, I, I think that goes for a lot of people. There's, there's yeah, a lot of people that they have the specialized – they're either specialized in offense, specialized yeah. in defense, but, but really can't handle the whole team. It's not a Absolutely. an uncommon situation. Yeah, and I think we, we kind of go back and on the, on, on the other side, you, Pittsburgh's defense is the same thing, right? And that's – I mean, Pittsburgh's undefeated, and the big reason why is that defense. Uh, they they turned the, they forced turnovers they forced sacks they they held Lamar Jackson in check made him look like the quote unquote running back yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of scouts picked him out to be right and that's a former MVP a guy who's only 23 years old and can still play at a really high level and they may and I mean you look at what they did to Baker Mayfield a couple weeks ago yeah. pitching a shutout against that team and. The Pittsburgh defense is here to stay too. I, I like both of those teams a lot. So the, there's one thing um, I'll, I'll go. I'll touch on your uh, T.J. Watt um, perspective. Why I don't like him, and why I don't like. Basically, it's not really his fault. But when well, one of the most popular things he does is he goes for the forced fumble. He goes for the punch. And then uh, there, there was actually um, on the uh, pregame show last week. Uh, uh, on C- uh, CBS, I saw the uh, the episode, and they were talking about how it's a tactic where he like punches down, like really full f- punches mm-hmm. to try to get the ball down, and um, w- which is abs- which is fantastic when it works out. But when it doesn't work out, th- there's no penalties called or anything for. I think he, he like he punched Sam Darnold. I, I think it was like in the jock or something like that one mm-hmm. time, trying trying to get one of these uh, forced fumbles, and it's just it's it's not penalized. I think that. If he goes for it and he swings and misses and actually like punches somebody, like that, there should be some kind of like penalty or something. For I think that. unless you hit him in the head, then you're. If, if you punch somebody in the gut, though, I mean, like you're, yeah, you're but there's a lot worse that goes on in a in a. 
pile than the, the, the punch mar- being thrown. But the margin, the margin for error, you, you know, you're going for a full swing. The right. margin for error, you know, the ball's one place, and you're trying to get down to it, which is which is great if you end up hitting it and then it, it, it fumbles are you, out. Are you are you bringing this up because you punched Sam Darnold? I, I'm saying that, that that's where that's where it caught that my you're upset. That's because where it caught my attention. But you, you look, you, you look football. all over. It's football. You're running into somebody as hard as you can, forcefully. Pretty much with your head, right? They're trying to take that out of the game. But let's be honest. These guys are running at each other full force, and it's a car crash every time they hit each other. Right. If you're swinging, unless you swing in the head, which we also saw in the the Chicago game, which we can get into in a little bit, too, if we have some time. But unless you swing in the head, which is a penalty, it's roughing the passer, then it's a tackle. You're trying to make a tackle. What's the difference between you swinging this way and you're trying to force yourself down on the ball, or you're coming with both hands to wrap up and make a tackle. You're you're still swinging your arm around to try to make a tackle. Yeah, you know? but so I mean, just you're just upset because Sam Darnold's been getting hit way too much. Sam nah, Darnold's probably is, not going to be on the yeah. Jets at the end of the year anyway. Nah, it's like so, 50, I think he has like 50 then, sacks against yeah, him this so, year. Look, exactly. the guy can't even throw yeah. a slant, a two-step slant route without yeah. getting hit. So. He can't have a he can't take a four step drop without well, getting hit. The, the so Steelers haven't be, played the Jets this year, so this is not this is something that I've like basically has been cooking for the past couple of years. I, I just I just don't see how you can openly swing and then miss and then actually punch some physically punch somebody. Because if he doesn't, and it doesn't hit the get ball, because if he doesn't hit the ball, it's more like more than likely a tackle at least. No, it's hitting the body though. Right, but the guy goes down to the ground, right? <laughs> So it's a tackle. We get one point on the scorecard, too. Absolutely. <laughs> or sack's a sack. Sack's yeah. a sack. Doesn't matter if he goes down with a punch or he goes down because <laughs> I tackle him by a shoestring. Sack's a sack. And he'll take that all the way to the bank. And he will. Yeah! We're going to have to agree to disagree on that one. So uh, 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 <laughs> uh, a, f- a fun stat when it comes to uh, offensive players. So uh, I looked up the top three receiving yard mm-hmm. uh, leaders. And um, – DeAndre Hopkins for the Cardinals is number one. Stephon Diggs is for Buffalo is or Buffalo Bills is uh, number two, and Robbie Anderson for the Jets is yeah. uh, at number three. So these are all interesting. Off-season. The Jets decide not to pay a guy, and he leads the league in yards. Yeah, well, the the my they have no other weapons around Sam Darnold. Well, that's... my highlight was the uh, the fact that they were all like in their first year, so that there's nobody. First year with a new, doing new team and a new yeah, system. Yeah, so first year, um, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, well, when it comes to Robbie Anderson, uh, he actually had a lot of off-field issues. So I, I, I don't, I, I didn't personally think that it was a bad idea when the Jets let him walk. Uh, Jets have a lot more issues than a number one receiver right now. I agree, but when you're talking about a guy with a lack of offensive production, then. You see a guy like Robbie Anderson in Carolina making Who, plays. Who's what you know? One of the one of the biggest uh, attributes of Robbie Anderson was his speed and being able yeah. to get down the field. So with with the weak ass offensive line that the Jets have, who's to say that he, that Sam Darnold would even have enough Absolutely, time to get him? Right, you're probably right. But if you lock a guy up long term, like he was due this year, right? Uh, that's a piece you don't have to worry about. And he's a, he would have been a good compliment, in my opinion, to Jamison Crowder, who – and if Denzel Mims comes back and plays, if he doesn't opt out, right? Um, you talk about some of the pieces that Sam Darnold might have. He's not throwing to Braxton Berrios, right? He's yeah. not throwing to guys that they're pulling off the street, right? Yeah. So he has something else to throw the ball to, and it's another body. And you look at the success – that he's having in Carolina, and a lot of that's due to guys like Curtis Samuel, guys like DJ Moore, who are really good in Carolina, and they just needed that one extra piece, and now you have it. And they've you've seen them be successful without their big name, $9 million a year, I believe, player in Christian McCaffrey, yeah. where he – or he just got paid $90 million. He got paid a lot of money this recently. Something mm-hmm. with a nine, if I remember correctly. Um, probably just making that up. But he uh, – and he's been out quite a bit, and Carolina's still found a way to be successful. And a lot of that's due to Robbie Anderson, DJ Moore, Teddy Bridgewater's playing really well. Like a lot of people thought that he would um, once he got healthy and once he was able to, to get his own shot at it rather than sitting on the bench. And you saw it last year when he was in New Orleans, and now he's doing it in Carolina. Absolutely. So we're going to go to Coach of the Year. Who you got? Uh, Mike Tomlin. Right yeah, now, it's not even close, disagree. right? Mike Tomlin, you can just do everything. 
You look He's at a man. guy, yeah. You look at a guy like Mike Tomlin, who has been successful, won Super Bowls, been to Super Bowls. Uh, but he, I feel like he flies under the radar a lot when we talk about the best coaches in the league. He's been the most steady, I think, aside from Bill Belichick. I think he's been the most steady, uh, good coach in the league. You look at what that what he did with that team last year when Ben went down with his elbow injury, and you see the success they had with Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges, who yeah. Dev, uh, Devlin Hodges. If we're Where are they for, now? <laughs> yeah, well, they're they're on the bench, yeah. right? They're there. The culture he's built in Pittsburgh is a next man up mentality in the same way that it is in New England. Just he runs it different. He's more of a player's coach. It's not a the quote unquote Patriot way. He does his own his own way, and he really goes to battle for those guys. And you listen to some interviews with guys like Minka Fitzpatrick, T.J. Watt. You listen to the – I mean, there's reasons why they're there. And if they don't fit the mold, they're gone. He's not hesitant to get rid of guys, a la Antonio Brown and Lev Bell. Yeah. Guys that don't fit the system or it's not a me mentality, it's us. And that's that worker's mentality that he's built in Pittsburgh. And it's paying off this year in a big way. They're 7-0. and They just beat probably the best team in the, – the other best team in yeah. their division, right? Yep. Um, they got a big matchup this weekend. And they're just going to continue to roll, I think. I'd say. Um, Besides Mike Tomlin, fix somebody else. I, I, I mean, Mike Tomlin's like the Tim Duncan of, uh, of football coaches. Yeah. I don't, I don't, He's the Popovich of it. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan. Um, I guess you'd, I'd have to go with um, Pete Carroll and the the the, uh, with the job he's doing with the with the Seattle, just because. When you when you look at you know you have the you have a consensus MVP candidate for a lot of people, um, including Harris, yeah. <laughs> um, and you 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 they're in the strongest division. Like the, there's the the Niners are uh, at the bottom at 500, and everybody else has a winning record. So that 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 means they're facing each other week after yeah. week, and they're at the top of the division. I, I now I, let me ask you, <clears throat> would you consider Kyle Shanahan from San Fran? Um. At this point, think about all nah, of the injuries man. that that team. They're going into this game to actually that game is tonight against Green Bay, right. and not a single player that touched the ball in last year's NFC Championship game is playing in the game tonight. That's how many injuries they have at the at, at the midway point, and they're still winning games. I mean, they're four and four, so it's not that, that's not exactly all right. But we just talked about the the toughest division in yeah. the league. All right, they beat they lost to the Rams. Right, they lost to Seattle, but you lose. They don't have a single running back that was on that team last year that had 270 yards from scrimmage. Well, one of those wins that were against the Jets, so they're kind of like really realistically yeah, they're, like three, the they're like they three. They're like three and four. Doors off. We yeah, know. so they're like three and four, really, if you look at it. <laughs> so not exactly. Not exactly I don't disagree with you, but stuff. I think that the job he's doing with the talent that he has is noteworthy. It it is, but um, there's there's always you always have great performances across the board. Like mm-hmm. there's always going to be, you know, like people with notable mentions and things like that. But when you, when you're looking at the MVP, you're looking at like the best of the best. And uh, can it develop into that? Like if if they end up trumping the the uh, the Seattle and you know every, every everybody else and winning the division, then yeah, of course. Be- Who's the worst coach this year? Not name Adam Gase because we Adam, that's I mean, a that's a high else? school team that's who playing. Who else can you there. Adam Gase? Well. Um, uh, that, I guess that they, has they, a job they, still. That I wasn't know, well, fired damn, yet. Yeah. That wasn't fired. That was wasn't already fired. Well, I mean, Adam Gates got to be. It. I mean, there's no there's no other logistical. Answer Mike McCarthy. Right. Um, I mean, he's in a rough situation in Dallas, though. I mean, they, they, Dak they, was they, there for a little bit, you, and they couldn't win games. I think anybody who takes, you know, when you look at all the successful teams right now, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of them are hap- Like the the good majority is happening with. Coaches that have been there for a while. There's not like there's not a lot of first year coaches coming in and, and super dominating. It's really hard for you know, especially with no preseason, the the, the remote learning that they, the NFL sure. teams have had to have had to go through. Um, I, but I, I for can't that team to be say, that bad with those weapons, uh, and to, to be in the dysfunction that they have, it's, it's not it's just bad. that they're losing. Yeah. It's the way that they're losing. It's bad, but right? it's not it's not Adam Gates bad though. Well no, I mean, it's besides Adam we know Adam Gates can't run an organization yeah. to save his life and he needs to be <laughs> fired. We've we've established this week after week, right? Every time we talk about the NFL, we talk about how bad Adam Gates is. 
the, they, they, the, the, one of the biggest uh, social media jokes is that they like he had, he must have like you know like dirty pictures of uh, of Woody Johnson or something like that. Who knows? Like, but something Joe going said on he's with part them. of the future yeah. of that organization. He's got something if, on. If he's part of the future of that organization, yeah. you can count on Trevor Lawrence not being part of that future yeah. because he's going to say, bad. "I'm, not, I'm yeah. he's going to pull an Eli. I'm not playing here if he's the yeah. coach. That's for sure." It's bad. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, all right. So we'll move on to. Surprise team of the year in a good light. Who do you got? I'm going to go with the Cleveland Browns. Interesting. Why? Because they're 5-2. and two. Well, they were 5-2. and two. I think they were 6-3. Five and three. Yeah, 5-3. Yeah. and three. Um, and Is it because this... they finally won five games? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like the, they're, they're historically bad. The, you, you, teams with the st- – they, they, they talk about it as not – a big deal and everything's just week to week. But, you know, the, the, the ones that have the stigma, they, they, they carry that with them, you know. So it's something that, you know, throughout years and years, and then they've, they've had a lot of high draft picks and they haven't worked out. And, you know, like they're actually finally being good and relevant. I have to say, you know, because you look at all the other top teams, they've already been good. You know, like I'd say uh, it'd be, it would be a, between the Cleveland Browns and the Arizona Cardinals. But okay. the the Arizona Cardinals, I'll get to it a little bit, but um, the Cleveland Browns, I mean, they're just good. You know, like they're they're actually finally worth a damn. Yeah, yeah I I would agree. That's definitely a, a good pick for for that one. I think that they've had their peaks and valleys this year for sure. Um, you look at the game against this past weekend against Oakland, they did not look good. You look at the game against the Steelers. Where people were asking questions whether Baker Mayfield can be the guy. I'm I've said on this show I'm a Baker fan. Baker is a good quarterback in my opinion. He does belong as the face of that franchise. He's showing that as best he can with the pieces that are around. I think him. just too many commercials. Too, I love the many, commercials. You don't like them? No, Those I mean, progressive I like commercials them, are I just, hilarious. I just think it's 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 pressure and it's putting you know it's putting him on a pedestal before he's able to. Oh that. yeah, I think absolutely. That, that, that's a part. You know, it's not exactly his fault. But when you have but, fifteen quarterbacks in fifteen years, yeah. in in Cleveland, that's going to happen, yeah. right? So, you're talking about a franchise that had fridge refrigerators filled with beer chained shut before they could win a game, and now they've got five wins. You could 100 percent say that that's a surprise of the year, right? My surprise team of the year. I hate it. It makes my skin crawl to even think this, but it's the Dolphins. Um, you look at what Brian Flores is doing down there. You take out this past weekend with Tua's debut because we'll get in, I'll get into that in a second. But the pieces that Brian Flores has been able to bring in and the defense that he's put together. Don't even look at the offense. Let's just, let's, let's take a look at the defense first. That defense is establishing themselves as one of the best defenses in the league, mm-hmm. and they will be continuing to improve. You look at the game this past weekend against L.A., it was the defense that won that game. Tua had his debut. We can talk about that. Tua, yeah, Tua won his first start. He threw for 93 yards in his first start with one touchdown. It was the defensive side of the ball that won that game for him. And we kind of just roll through that. And it, the, he's building a team down there that's going to be competitive. And it's going to, as long as the Jets can figure out how to become competitive again, it's going to make that AFC East a big competitive division again. I'd have to, uh, I'd have to still agree with the uh, Dolphins pick uh, as much as I don't like it. Yeah, but, yeah can't it's, stand them. Yeah, it's definitely what the defense is definitely where it's at over there. So, uh, all right, so our show ran a little long, but that's going to be our show for today. Uh, thank you very much for Harris for coming by and being a constant uh, co-host for us. <laughs> and, uh,